Thank you. I'm going to speak about something very different from what uh, Tuhin and uh, Suchetana have spoken. Uh, this is some work I've carried out with my student, uh, uh, Ratul Ravindran, back at IIT Madras in Chennai. Um, it's well known that you can get a nearly scale invariant spectrum uh, from inflation. In fact, many models lead to um, such a spectrum, which is remarkably consistent with the CMB data. However, what has been found is that certain features in the primordial spectrum improve the fit to the data. Such features are easy to generate in the context of inflation, inflationary trajectory being an attractor. You can introduce small departures from slow roll, and the attractor nature of the trajectory brings it back to the slow roll. And so you can have brief departures from scale invariance, and these features can improve the fit to the CMB data. The bouncing scenarios uh, are an alternative to the inflationary paradigm. In complete contrast to inflation, uh, other than a small class of models, many of the bouncing models are not attractors. Therefore, it is difficult to generate features in such bouncing models, and in fact, these models will be ruled out if future observations confirm the presence of features in the primordial spectrum. The only bouncing model that permits features are so-called equiratic bounces, and it is this what I will be talking about here. And uh, I should begin by, I will begin by a brief introduction to bouncing scenarios, and then I will talk about what are known as near band matter bounces. It is easy to generate nearly scale invariant spectra and bouncing scenarios. Uh, it's just that, as I mentioned, these models will not be attractors. I will talk about one such model, how you can generate nearly scale invariant spectra, and then I will introduce um, the idea of egg pyrosis, and I will talk about generating features in egg pyrosis, features that you know, have been considered often in the context of inflation. This talk is based on these three pieces of work. One has been published and two are uh, available as preprints. Few remarks about bouncing scenarios. These bouncing scenarios that I'm going to talk about are classical bounces. They correspond to situations where the universe goes through a period of contraction uh, until the scale factor reaches a minimal value, and then it transits to an expanding phase. As I will discuss in a later slide, in a slide later, um, uh, you, they, you know, they offer an alternative to the inflationary paradigm to overcome the horizon problem, and you can you know, impose well-motivated Minkowski-like initial conditions on the perturbations at very early times during the contracting phase. What you will require is actually non-accelerated contraction in complete contract in con you know, contrast to accelerated expansion in the context of inflation. However, often matter fields have to violate various null energy conditions to achieve bounces, and there are indeed genuine concerns whether you know, quantum gravitational effects can be completely ignored and classical bounces can be considered. I'm going to you know, uh, keep them aside, keep those problems aside. So how do you overcome the horizon problem in, in, in bounces? The left figure is standard stuff from the Colbin Turner's text. What we have are the uh, Hubble radius and the evolution of the physical wavelength in red and blue, respectively. And if you have an epoch of inflation, you can have these physical wavelengths smaller than the Hubble radius and ensuring, you know, so that you can have well motivated initial conditions, the Bunch Davis initial conditions, where they are well inside the Hubble radius. Non accelerated contraction, like a matter dominated contraction, can also provide such initial conditions. I have done the same thing here. Um, I have plotted the physical wavelength again in blue, this is like this, and the Hubble radius in red, and the Hubble radius actually you know, diverges at the bounds. And as I mentioned, if you have non accelerated contraction, you can ensure that the modes are well inside the Hubble radius and you can impose Bunch Davies initial conditions. How do you achieve bounces of this type? Well, what you do is that if you can, you know, what I have here is a bounce which has been modeled in this fashion in terms of the conformal time eta. And such a bounce can be achieved with the help of two fluids, for instance, one you know, which behaves, if epsilon is equal to zero, it behaves like matter, and uh, you know, this will behave like radiation in this context, and, but you will, need, you will require the energy density to be negative in order to achieve such bounces. 
How do you model with the help of scalar fields? You can model this with the help of two scalar fields, one canonical scalar field to achieve the matter contraction, and another which has negative energy density, a ghost field, and uh, it can be completely, you know, the scale factor that I wrote down here can be completely modeled in terms of these two fields, and the there are two parameters here, the epsilon and the rho naught, rho naught will set you know, the scale of the amplitude of the perturbations and epsilon will determine the tilt in the perturbations. You have two fields, you can solve for the perturbations, the scalar perturbations and the tensor perturbations, and what I have here are the evolution of these perturbations in these bounces. What I didn't bother to mention is the script N, and which is, appears here, it is, you know, instead of writing as A N as e power N, you know, which can describe only, you know, if n is positive, which can, you know, I'm sorry, which is only a growing function, monotonically growing function, in contrast to describe a scale factor, which is, you know, contracting and then expanding, you, we have introduced a slightly different uh, uh, e-fold, which is called en squared, uh, which goes as en squared, and what we have here in the x-axis is the script n, and as is well known in these models, what you have is that the perturbations grow very rapidly as one approaches the bounds, and once the expansion sets in, they, you know, they sort of stabilize. You have the curvature perturbation in blue, the tensor perturbation in red, and the iso curvature which decay after the, um, in the, once the expansion starts. And in this particular model, you can show that the tensor to scalar ratio is rather large, like 20 or so, and you know, because of this rapid amplification of the curvature perturbation close to the bounds, it ends up being 10 power minus 6 or so after the bounds. Now, in the context of inflation, there have been various features that, that have been generated and studied compared with the data. Um, and these features can be broadly classified as follows, one which leads to a sharp cutoff on large scales, another which leads to a burst of oscillations corresponding to L equal to, somewhere between L equal to 20 and 30, which improves the fit over those scales, and another which is generated by the so-called axion monotomy model, which leads to persistent oscillations over a wide range of scales, and these can be generated with inflationary potentials that either contain a step like this, or contain oscillations, or it contains a point of inflection, which has been considered recently in the context of formation of primordial black holes as well. How do you generate such features in the context of um, bouncing scenarios? Well, you have to um, you have to turn to equirosis. The bottom line is as follows: If you are working with a scale factor of this of this type, and you want a stable contraction. It is very simple to achieve. You know that the you know, power law scale, back, scale factor can be achieved with exponential potentials. You can achieve such contraction with an exponential potential, just that the potential, this has to be negative. V0 has to be negative. And this is the standard epirotic scenario. And what one can show is that if lambda squared is greater than 6, which corresponds to stiff matter, you can have an, you know, uh, uh, phase of stable contraction. And we would try to generate features with an, by introducing features in the I'm sorry, in this equirotic potential. But the challenge is as follows. Since, you know, lambda squared is greater than six, what you will find is that you will get a strongly blue power spectrum, curvature perturbation spectrum, and you have to make it, you know, red or with an NS of like 0.96 or so. How do you achieve this? You achieve this by introducing a second field, and you use the presence of the isocurvature perturbation to convert these isocurvature perturbations into curvature perturbations, and that can be introduced by a second field, chi. Uh, we have the, the original potential, the exponent exponential potential, and you introduce the second field, chi, and you introduce a turn in this trajectory. What it leads to is as follows. There is a coupling uh, function, which I've called xi, which relates, uh, which determines the effect of the iso curvature on the curvature perturbation as the field turns you have a sharp you know rise and fall in xi which sort of amplifies the curvature perturbation in blue and the iso curvature perturbation which is always growing in this contracting phase and in such a case you can generate scale invariant spectra um, you know uh, red tilted spectra and uh, you can also introduce features because of the fact that this equirotic phase is an attractor. All these are displayed here. There are, you know, eight quantities. One, you know, power spectra that have been plotted, power spectra before and after the turn in field space. 
what you will find is as follows. Initially, the curvature perturbation spectrum is something like this, while the ISO curvature is much higher. The ISO curvature are dominant. But as you introduce this turn in field space, what you will find is that the curvature and the ISO curvature are roughly same in amplitude, and the shape of the spectra is determined by the shape of the ISO curvature perturbation spectrum. This is the bottom line. And you can generate what we have plotted here, or the various spectra we have got from egg pyrosis, and compared it with the three different inflationary spectra with features that I had talked about earlier. There are many challenges that remain, and they are as follows. You can indeed generate features in the primordial spectra during, in, a, um, in a bouncing scenario, provided you assume it is, is that you know, you have, there is a phase of egg pyrosis that occurs. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, many of the simpler and fine-tuned bouncing models would prove to be unsustainable if um, features are indeed seen to be present in the primordial spectra. And for the first time, we have been able to show that such features can be generated in bouncing models. What we have done is that we have not evolved these perturbations across the bounds in the other simpler model that I had originally shown. We have evolved it prior to the bounds. This needs to be evolved across the bounds, but some of the simple efforts that have been you know, carried out in this context show that the bounds will not change the shape of the primordial spectra. They may change their amplitude, but they will not change its shape. But we need to still evolve these perturbations and show that they indeed retain their shape. And the last thing is related to non-gaussianities. Non-gaussianities can be large in these bouncing models. This is something we are currently investigating. What is the non-gaussianities associated with features in the pyrotic phase? Thank you. Ram? So questions? So are the isocurvatures completely converted to adiabatic in these cases? Or the, completely. You saw that... Because there's a strong constraint on isocurvature from plan. Yeah, yeah. The, so the isocurvature the has that, to... Yeah, I'm aware of it. So what happens is that um, here, notice isocurvature still remains dominant. ISO curvature will decay only after the bounce. This is the experience. So what we need to do is that I will not be able to concretely say what happens until I've evolved it across the bounce. But I expect it to decay. So the there has been is, some efforts. Yeah. So if you impose the constraint on ISO curvature from Planck, staying within that constraint, can you still generate the right spectrum and the right amplitude for the adiabatic perturbations or not? I'm telling you that I'm repeating my statement. I need to evolve these perturbations across the bounds, which I haven't d still done that. Okay, but there has been efforts uh, uh, by um, uh, Fertig et al., um, uh, Look Learners, and others at Max Planck, where they have evolved. And some in those cases, in all the cases, I know isocurvatures decay after the bounds. Um, my gut feeling is that if I use additional fields to evolve them across the bounds, those isocurvatures will decay. Uh, so, the precise evolving through the bounce, I guess, depends on the mechanism you use to resolve the singularity. And I guess these guys had a particular model. And this Fertig at all, they yeah. have at least there are two or three models I know yeah. uh, where they have been able to evolve across the bounce, and uh, uh, very, you know, uh, small k compared to the k uh, corresponding to the bounce remain unaffected. What will happen is that the amplitude will shift. One has to be careful in the presence of features because, you know, in a scale invariant or nearly scale invariant, shifting amplitude will not affect considerably. But when you have features, there can be relative shifts, okay? But if the scales are considerably separated, my gut feeling is that the shape will remain unaffected across the bounds. But it is something I need to establish. Okay, that's Something fine. I forgot. I should thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to give this uh, talk at this meeting. Thank you. Yeah.